um, Political Studies Association, What's Happening in Contemporary Politics event. Um, uh, a little bit first of all about the Political Studies Association. So we're a, um, a learning society that looks after the that looks after the study of politics in um, in Britain, um, which is which which is a very difficult job and very very hard, and we don't enjoy it at all. I'm lying. It's really good fun. Um, so um, so what we've been wanting to do um, a, a, a bit more of. I mean I mean obviously we look at, uh, thinking about uh, politics or the study of politics. Um, we're talking about people um, from you know, uh, from schools right the way through to obviously universities and research. But we feel really we feel it's really important to um, to spend a lot more time talking with with people who work in politics and also with members of the public as well. Just sharing our enthusiasm about politics and just having a bit of a geek fest. So um, so that's what we're here to that, that's what we're here to do this evening. Um, uh, so what we have here, we have um, Michael Michael Quick from ITN, who needs no introduction, um, who's going to chair the event for us, and then we have um, we have a whole range of, of specialists um, uh, who are going to talk to us about about some of the momentous things that have been happening across across um, uh, Western politics. Um, Focusing on populism and populism in um, uh, in the West today, so um, so we'll have so they'll be talking about their subject areas, and then after that um, we're going to have a have a, a question and answer round table. So what I'm really hoping is that during the first part of the, part of the session you can be thinking about lots of really really interesting questions because it'd be great to have a lively discussion afterwards. Now Ariana is going to talk a little bit about the specialist groups and what they do. Well, very briefly, hello everyone, my name is Ariana Giovannini, I'm one of the trustees of the Political Studies Association, and with Joni, we work, we focus in particular on the specialist group. They do deserve a couple of words, because the specialist group are a massive asset for these political studies associations. We have 58 specialist groups, only a few members of, of them obviously are here tonight, but um, they are active, they are very active, they provide a wide range of expertise. You can find uh, out more about them on our website, so on the PSA website, follow them also on Twitter, because with all the things that are happening at the moment, across Western and European <coughs> democracies, and if you want to get more information about the election or whatever debates are occurring at the moment, they are a great source of information and uh, people you can debate openly with and get information from. So I think that's all for me now. I had a couple of logistical things. Um, we're not expecting a, um, a fire alarm right now or this evening. Um, but if there, so, if there, if there is a fire alarm, then what you need to do is you need to go down these stairs here and um, out of the main door. And the assembly point is um, by the duke on the left-hand side. And if you need the toilets, they're down the stairs to the right, and then you keep going down um, uh, down the stairs to the right. Okay. Right. With no further ado, let's hand over to Michael. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Jeremy. Um, the, the blurb you sent me for tonight says that we've got to be, we're going to be exploring what's been going on in the last 18 months in Western politics. But for me, it dates back quite a long way before that. I remember I first sort of felt something was afoot in the Eastleigh by-election, which was what February, March, I think, 19, uh, 2012. Uh, you UKIP had uh, done well in a string of by-elections, and I even was so rash as to set, go on air and say, I think UKIP might just win this by There's a possibility they might win this by-election. And they very nearly did. And of course, we then saw UKIP win the European elections in 2014. We saw in Scotland, uh, independence uh, only lose by 10%, which was a massive shock uh, at the time. Uh, and of course, we then saw UKIP again do well in the 2015, pick up a couple of by-elections, do well in the 2015 election. And then suddenly, on the other side, the rise of uh, Jeremy Corbyn and the transformation of the Labour Party into probably the biggest mass, mass member organisation uh, there's ever been in this country. Um, meanwhile, uh, Trump in America, uh, not only Trump, Bernie Sanders on the Democrat side uh, gave Hillary Clinton a very close run uh, for her money. I mean, it's extraordinary that Bernie Sanders that was for years and years the only socialist in the US Congress, <coughs> sort of, you know, an oddity, uh, doing so well. France, Marine Le Pen, 33% uh, last year. Ah, Emmanuel Macron, does he fit with, how does he fit within uh, how we're going to be discussing 
uh, tonight. And of course, developments in uh, Five Star Movement in Italy, uh, Podemos in, in Spain, Syriza in Greece, uh, and, and so on. Developments in, in nearly every Western country of a type that some people say uh, are populist. Uh, is that a useful word? Is it just a pejorative term? Is it even a ter just a term of abuse? Can we think of some other way of uh, describing these things? So we've got a great panel tonight uh, to go into that. I'm going to be very, very strict. You're limited, I'm afraid, all of you, to seven minutes. And I'm going to stick to that with my story. So if you've got important things to say, I suggest you say it at the beginning uh, before I cut you off. Um, and we're going to start uh, with uh, Andy Knott of the... Um, of the populism group on the end there. So, Andy, you have seven minutes, starting from now. It is. Okay. Um, there's a lively discussion about what populism refers to, how to define it, and how to characterise it. And this is largely because, unlike other bodies of thought, that is compared with largely ideologies such as liberalism, conservatism, socialism, and so forth, Populism historically has been episodic, which is why we're talking about the momentous events. Uh, um, it erupts onto the political stage, hence discussion of a populist explosion or moment or eruption and so forth. It also has uh, minimal identifiable features, or as certain commentators have called it, it is thin in terms of content. Um, so, uh, Kaz Mulvey and, and Kautvasa, they regard populism to be what they call a thin-centred ideology. Despite this, there is agreement on a few features regarding populism. Um, first, um, what I'll call its political subject, which is the people. Again, this is the cause of much confusion, because unlike Marxism, which has the working class or the proletariat, or liberalism, which has the individual. Um, other ideologies um, that uh, claim, other ideologies claim the people as their own subject. So think of conservatism, fascism, and sometimes even social democracy. Um, but there's also pretty broad agreement about how um, uh, uh, um, how populism conceives of the people. This is distinct from the understanding that springs in political philosophy from Thomas Hobbes, but think of Churchill, I think, may well be the best or, or the most recent example here, um, where the people is considered to be unitary, that it has one will, which kind of forges a seamless link between the leader and the people itself. So there's a kind of uh, um, umbilical core there. Populism's people, by contrast, emerges in opposition to um, whatever they call it, leaders, elites, the establishment, or sometimes even more specific phenomena such as imperialism or neoliberalism. And this is why populist leaders, parties, or movements emerge from outside the extant organisation of things and are the product of much surprise from within that erstwhile order. In such circumstances, populism operates by articulating how the elite or the establishment has failed or thwarted the people and um, that their project can re remedy that failure. So there's something inherently performative about populism here. But beyond those two points, there isn't too much agreement about what populism is, and I want to finish on one feature that are, I think, important to considerations about populism. Amongst many curiosities around populism, many who are labelled as populists reject that label, whereas those who de designate themselves, their parties or their movements as populists, are not broadly considered as populist. So Nigel Farage, him who has recently returned as an example, doesn't describe himself as a populist, but this epithet is bestowed upon him by his opponents, and Nick Clegg may well be the, the 
best example within British politics. Similarly, Marine Le Pen would willingly accept that she is a nationalist but does not characterize herself as a populist. In contrast, politicians associated with Syriza and Podemos readily accept the label. This situation follows from the widespread failure to distinguish between what I call left-wing and right-wing populism. Uh, so, to finish with a quick history le lesson, populism emerged in the United States in the late 19th century, courtesy of what was called the People's Party, which opposed itself to the political geopoly of the Democrats and the Republicans. It displayed then broadly left-wing characteristics. Populism has also been a key feature in Latin America since the 1930s, and it too pitched itself against imperialism and the oligarchy, and adopted left-wing programs and policies. And this has continued into the 21st century with the most recent wave of populism, it's called the third or the pink wave, um, but in contrast to that, Europe's history of populism has arguably, arguably been more recent since the 1970s. Uh, and this has affected our understanding of this phenomenon. Um, and is perhaps one of the reasons why the word is used in a purgative manner uh, um, across much of Europe these days. Uh, th thanks very much indeed. I should have said you're, you're at um, Brighton uh, University. Right, and uh, Mara, um, Oliver, uh, where do you want to next? Oh, all right. uh, that's all right. Yeah. You're, um, uh, I mean, uh, Andy said that uh, populism has started in America in the late 19th century, yes. so it's perhaps appropriate to come to you next, because that is your area of expertise in American politics. You have now uh, seven minutes to give us uh, <laughs> your take on, on uh, what's been going on in America. Um, all right, well, thank you so much. Thank you, Johnny, Rosie, and Aliana for organizing this great event, and thank you for having me. Well, uh, my first thought in, uh, when discussing populism in the US elections of 2016 is that certainly this is a watershed moment in, in US history, but the election uh, per se is a symptom of something bigger than just having Donald Trump in the White House. Um, I'm a historian, a political historian, so my profession teaches me that it's way too early for us to appreciate and understand uh, the full implications and consequences of uh, what happened back in November uh, 2016. So much has been written, indeed so much is being written every single day, not least because the president is a gift that keeps on giving, to put it mildly. <laughs> Um, All these people are. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, but you said in your introduction, Andy, that uh, the people are the core subject of the populist movement. So uh, for me, this begs the question, first of all, can we really call a billionaire, a man who surrounds himself with billionaires, who's had the privilege of bringing, who lives at the top of a tower named after him on Fifth Avenue, can we call him a populist? Of course, um, President um, candidate Trump was very um, loud and successful during the campaign and he grabbed the headlines very often, but as you mentioned, this was not just his ear, it was also Bernie Saunders' ear. And he was one of the front runners for the Democratic uh, ticket. And I think this very much validates what you've said, that it's very difficult to give a definite final definition of populism, because here you have two men that come from completely different backgrounds, two different ideologies, yet they manage to tap into the same group of people that feel very much abandoned by, um, by Washington and, uh, and the government. They both campaign on an anti-establishment platform, they both criticize corruption in Washington, they both criticize free trade. Now, history is not made of what if, but one cannot help but wonder what would have happened if the Democratic Party had chosen Bernie Son Saunders or if Hillary and Bernie had joined efforts. Who knows? We know definitely that the Democratic Party made the wrong choice in favoring uh, Hillary, because she lost. Um, she lost mainly because she was the candidate mostly uh, associated with the establishment. 
uh, her talks of her middle class upbringing fail to project the image of online of you. Indeed, her uh, 30 years of service became a liability because she became the symbol of everything that is wrong with big government and, big, uh, and Washington. Plus, obviously, the fact that she is a woman, and this shouldn't be forgotten, although it's not the main topic of um, after night meeting. Anyway, uh, we ended up with Donald Trump. Now, uh, as Andy said, populism has a long and durable tradition in American politics. Uh, Trump's uh, kind of populism has often been compared to uh, Jackson's kind of populism. It dates back to, as you said, to the um, People's Party, and much of Trump's rhetoric during the campaign um, followed the, the 1892 platform of the People's Party, from bias media to imported labor to um, insisting that the nation has been brought to the verge of moral, political, and, uh, and material ruin. Barrical Water ran on similar claims in 1964, <coughs> so did Pat Buchanan in the 90s, he ran on the slogan of American First. And to be fair, most successful um, American presidents from Theodore Roosevelt to Franklin Delano Roosevelt to Clinton all have been, to some extent, uh, populists. But leaders of both uh, parties have also been wary of populism tendency uh, to slide into the demagogy. <coughs> History has shown uh, that populists find it difficult to resist scapegoating minorities and outsiders, preferring simplistic and often unrealistic uh, solutions to complicated problems, destroying trust in every um, governmental and social institution, or other than uh, the military and the police. And certainly, Trump fits perfectly uh, this description. Think about his travel ban. Uh, his war uh, at the Mexican border or withdrawing from any international agreement. This, according to him, should solve all crime, terrorism, and uh, uh, social and economic problems. Now, of course, the question is um, why was he so successful uh, during the election, although he didn't win the popular vote? And again, we should remember that. But first of all, because economic prosperity um, is not what it used to be in the US. Economic inequality is at historic high levels. The rich are thriving, the middle class is surviving, and part of rural America, parts of rural America are dying. Economic stability is the core, the key to the survival of the American dream. And the American dream is also in danger because of uh, a demographic change. As a result of immigration and uh, uh, natural demographic shifts, the United States is getting less white. And this has triggered a culture of a clash, or if you want, uh, an identity crisis among those Americans who see um, a more equal society as a threat to their uh, privileged white place within it, or just people that would like everything to go back to the way it was, especially before the Obama years. Now, these issues, real or perceived, have created a perfect storm and Trump has been very skillful in exploiting this. Whether he generally believes in the cause or not, yes, I'm done. <laughs> um, we don't know, um, though I think that is a uh, uh, tax uh, reform for the rich or the way he uses the media to confuse the people uh, says a lot to this point. Regardless, he was able to tap into the group of people who feel that have been uh, betrayed by the government. Thank you very much indeed, Mara. And thank you again for. Sorry? Sorry. Oh, the... right. Okay. Um... Well, it's in, it's in line with what I was expecting. Next, uh, we're going to go to uh, Italy, uh, and Davida Bamper from uh, Aston University. We've got two Astonians here tonight. Yes. Uh, he's the first. Uh, and uh, you're going to tell us about developments there. Uh, and of course, we've got an election coming up there. You know, so. Uh, your seven minutes starts now. Okay. So, work? Yes. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, Populism <coughs> is not a new phenomenon in Italy. Uh, in the early 1990s, after the collapse of the established party system uh, due to corruption scandal, mobilization against the political elite played an important role in reshaping the whole party system. 
However, between the late 1990s and early 2000s, the process of kind of normalization and uh, stabilization of party dynamics uh, occurred. The Great Recession triggered a new phase of political instability uh, that opened new opportunities for uh, movements and parties uh, um, adopting a populist discourse uh, and embracing the concept of people against, against the elite. We can summarize uh, the current state of populist politics in Italy in a few points. So, in Italy we have at the moment two main populist parties, uh, the Northern League uh, and the Five Star Movement. Uh, the Northern League uh, is usually defined as a, a populist radical right party uh, and quite interestingly is the oldest political party currently represented in the Italian Parliament. Uh, it has been represented in Parliament since the late 1980s while all other parties have either collapsed or merged. Uh, and so this challenges the idea that populism is uh, an episodic phenomenon in this temporary. Um, in fact, it has been uh, recognized uh, that the Northern League has been able to adapt to different political circumstances and it has a kind of chameleonic, uh, changeable uh, nature of, of uh, uh, populism. Uh, and that has helped this party stay in government without losing uh, its political appeal and, over and it also overcame pro uh, periods of, of crisis and electoral uh, decline. One example of how the Northern League changed its, uh, uh, reframed its populist discourse is that the party started as a regionalist party, representative of the people of the north of Italy against Rome, against the south. Then it radicalized even more its discourse uh, uh, and became an indepe pro-independence party. Then it went back to federalism and under its current leader, Matteo Salvini, uh, that you can see here, uh, it has completely abandoned any kind of federalist discourse uh, and has become a nationalist party, like the Front National in, in France, uh, seeking to represent Italy as a whole against Brussels. Um, so um, the, target has, uh, um, the, the target has changed. It used to be Rome, now it's Brussels, but the populist discourse uh, um, it's still based on the struggle between uh, the oppressed people against uh, a geographically distant, exploitative and corrupt elite. It was in Rome, now it's in Brussels. Of course, the nativist element has always been a constant, although it has been interpreted in different ways. First it was North versus South, now it's Italians against immigrants. Uh, the second populist party, the Five Star Movement, uh, is uh, actually the youngest political party currently uh, in Parliament, so we have the oldest and the youngest party. It started as a network of local committees uh, that were linked to the blog, blog of a uh, former comedian, Beppe Grillo, and then uh, it started building a, a national structure. In the first general election of 20, uh, in, in the general election of 2013, uh, it ran for the first time and immediately got one fourth of the total vote. And that was the first time that the party achieved set that success in such a short time. And many factors contributed to its success, um, but there is a general consensus that the economic crisis that hit Italy and other Southern European countries determined a crisis of the established political system, which became more uh, vulnerable to anti-establishment campaigns that were uh, promoted by the Five Star Movement. Yet, unlike Syriza in Greece and Podemos in Spain, the type of populism represented by the Five Star Movement cannot be clearly located on the left-right uh, political continuum. Uh, I think this is a rather peculiar case of populist movement that marks a total break, clear break from the traditional left-right uh, divide. And interestingly, immediately after their electoral breakthrough in 2013, the leader of the Five Star Movement, Beppe Grillo, explicitly defined the, the movement as populist. So here they say proudly populist. So in some cases they define themselves as populist. And um, uh, it also excluded any kind of collaboration with either left or, or right. Um, things are changed because now Beppe Grillo decided to step aside the movement, which is now formally led by 31-year-old uh, uh, Luigi Di Maio, uh, who actually sought to portray the movement as a more credible identity, uh, alternative to the established parties. 
and uh, has not completely ruled out an alliance with uh, other populist movements, for example, the Northern League, like Tsipras did in Greece when he formed a coalition with the populist far right uh, party, the independent uh, uh, Greeks. Uh, then there is the case of Berlusconi. Is he a populist? Um, uh, there is, I, I tend to agree with the uh, argument that he is uh, a populist. Uh, he represents a type of a kind of neoliberal populism, less focused on immigration and national <coughs> issues than the uh, uh, Northern League, and more. Uh, it, the, this party plays more emphasis on campaigns against state bureaucracy, against the intellectual elite. But there is always an, an enemy, like in the typical populist uh, rhetoric. And also, Berlusconi adopted a communication style that can be defined as populist since he tried to establish a direct connection with the people. Uh, his party for a while was called the Il Popolo della Libertà, the people of freedom, so more populist than that. And in many respects, uh, he can be considered as a kind of precursor of, of Trump. So again, the case of Berlusconi shows that populism can be persistent. He started in 1994, he's still around, a bit changed, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> age, more than other things. Um, and uh, yeah, so it can be, and, but paradoxically today, uh, in the context of very aggressive and radical populism, actually Berlusconi is seen as a, 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 a factor of stability in Italy, and there are some European leaders that actually hope that Berlusconi would still vote from, from Salvini, from the radical right, that recently actually met also Juncker, so there is a kind of endorsement. Uh, uh, then there is the case of the Democratic Party, but probably I don't have a lot of time to talk about it. And I will just move to the uh, just a, a summary of the election uh, results. That uh, uh, so I mean actually the election will be on the fourth of, of March, and at the moment you can see that the Five Star Movement is the first party, <coughs> together with the Northern League. These two parties would get around 40% of the vote. In 2013, they got around 30% of the vote. So the populist wave is uh, getting stronger. The Forza Italia, Berlusconi's party, is also quite in, in good shape. And the Democratic Party, which is the incumbent party, uh, actually risks to, uh, I mean, is behind the Five Star Movement, but also behind the center right coalition, because Forza Italia and Northern League are forming a coalition. Also, the new voting system that was approved last year will not produce a clear majority. This will create more stability, instability, and then we can expect a further strengthening of populism in Italy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Davide. Uh, right, we're now moving to your, uh, your colleague uh, from Aston, Jim Shields, who's going to tell us all about France and whether <laughs> Macron counts as a pretty big one. Thank you all for and use the letter. We also need to get uh, this I have seven minutes and seven points. <laughs> They're not all one liners, so I'll be brisk. Be really good, Michael. Um, France in 2017 went through a seismic change, such as we've never witnessed since the founding of the Fifth Republic of 1958. In the presidential election, 26% of voters supported candidates from the established parties of government, post-Gaullists and socialists, while 74% opted to overthrow those parties and take a leap into the unknown in a climate of widespread disaffection with mainstream elites. And so into the presidency came a young upstart, Emmanuel Macron, who had never run for election at any level, going on to secure a parliamentary majority for his newly formed centrist party, a brand new party, a year old. The key reference points of French politics redrawn at a stroke. Macron's opponent in the presidential runoff was the leader of the far-right National Front, uh, Marine Le Pen. <coughs> And a comforting illusion quickly took hold that the rise of the far right in France and of populist forces generally had been reversed at the gates of the Elysee Palace. <coughs> With 66% of the runoff vote, the presidency went to a pro-EU, pro-globalization, liberal centrist. France 
voted massively for moderation over extremism. This is for me the wrong reading of that election. Marine Le Pen doubled her father, Jean-Marie Le Pen's score of 2002. With 34%, close to 11 million votes, she took her party to a new electoral high. In the first round, among 11 candidates, Le Pen came first in most of France's regions, in most departments, and in over 19,000 of the 36,000 communes, with Macron coming first in just 7,000. So Le Pen topping the poll in almost three times as many communes as Macron in the first round. If territorial dominance in one round of voting determined presidential elections, Marine Le Pen would now occupy the Elysee. And her passage to the runoff caused not the merest shock compared with the earthquake of her father reaching the same stage in 2002. The shock would have been had she not got there. Another reason why Macron's apparently sweeping victory should be viewed with caution lies in the groundswell of rejection. In the runoff, turnout was the lowest for almost 50 years, and spoiled ballots reached an all-time record with over 4 million voters going to the polls just to spoil their vote. Even against Le Pen, Macron could only attract 21 million votes, while 27 million electors withheld their support. 44% of registered voters supporting Macron, 56% not. So did France really vote massively for moderation over extremism? Not so simple. But Le Pen was not the only populist in this election. The far left firebrand, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, took just under 20% of the first round vote, coming close to provoking a presidential runoff between far right and far left. Le Pen and Mélenchon between them took 41% of the presidential vote to Macron's 24% in the first round. If we add other nationalist and anti-capitalist candidates, the radical anti-system vote ran close to 50%. So where are they now? Having won almost half the presidential vote, these candidates saw their parties win under 5% of seats in the National Assembly elections that followed. They are institutionally marginalised, but their voters are still out there. And what of Macron? anticipated by Michael's uh, brief comment, his victory was widely seen as a victory over populism, the very antithesis of populism. But he won his election by raiding the populist's toolbox. Macron's victory was a form of electoral insurgency, built on charismatic appeal, disillusionment with governing elites, and a crisis in traditional politics. He adopted the classic populist posture of the outsider, despite being an archetypal insider, and pitched himself as a providential saviour calling for a revolution, albeit democratic. He formed his start-up movement as a purely personal electoral vehicle, even down to its initials, en marche, Emmanuel Macron. We've seen this called mainstream populism, soft populism, anti-populist populism, whatever the label, there's a good deal of the populist style about Macron. More than that, Macron's success in destroying the old centre-left and severely weakening the centre-right favours the continued challenge of the populist extremes by removing much of what separates him from them. While the alternative to Macron is Le Pen or Mélenchon, He's bolstered. But we need to wonder, and this is my concluding point, given the damage Macron helped inflict on the traditional parties of government, what will fill the gap when the Macron phenomenon has run its course? The only certainty for now is that all the factors favouring populism, economic pressures, high unemployment, discontent with elites, fears over borders, globalisation, immigration and security remain. 
And though Macron has had a charmed first nine months, the new political landscape over which he rules has beneath it still all the fault lines that brought about the seismic shifts of last year. Four seconds short. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> now, sorry, Josephine, uh, the, uh, uh, you're from 